You are now tuned in to Not Without Alonzo. Yes, somebody else had a question? Yes. I would never say that on tape. <laughs> I would never say that on tape. Ain't no way the world I'm asking that question right now. I got a microphone on. <laughs> but you know, it was very suspicious. I'm going to tell you, it was very suspicious. <laughs> it was very suspicious that nobody, that nobody in his immediate area had AIDS but him. You have to understand, I knew easy. Easy was at my house about a month before he died. Wow. He was healthy as anybody in this room. Yeah. When I've talked to people who were there up close and personal as bodyguards, and when he, they said uh, they were so confused because Easy went to the hospital, said, for time's sake, for time's sake, he went to the hospital on a Sunday. He called him, he called him Tuesday, hey man, let's, ha let's hang out for a while. He, you know, he was. He said, "I found out I, I got I got a disease, and let's play cards. I'm a, I, I can beat it. It's early enough." Same guy said he went back three, four days later. He's in a, under an oxygen tank on life support. The guy said he brought a deck of cards. They would they, they play blackjack all the time, and he's like, "Next thing you know, there's there's a there's a a, 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 a preacher and a lawyer. I'm like, what are you guys doing?" And he gets married on his deathbed. They didn't show you that straight out of Compton. He got married on his deathbed. Yeah. He didn't get, it, it don't show you certain things they don't so, show you straight out of Compton. Easy was not as broke as they claim he, he was straight out of Compton. He was not bagging up weed trying to pay his house note. That's not going to happen. His house note was probably about five or six G's. He wasn't bagging up weed to sell, pay, pay his house note. Not until he got, not until he got to the hospital. He, he went in single, came out married. Wow. <laughs> married and dead. Anyway. Anybody else? Yes. The shift in, in, in uh, music marketing comes from a, very, a, a few different places. One, it's the natural progression. At one point in time, for, before hip hop came, was, was popular, uh, Ohio was where everybody came from. New York is the center of all record companies. Uh, at some point in time, California came, came into light. New York started hip hop, it jumped all the way over came to the West Coast, and then it, it kind of went backwards from there. Uh, St. Louis had his run with Nelly. When Master P came out with, uh, with his song, Mr. Ice Cream Man, which, which is basically my song, Turn Off the Lights, if you listen to it again, it's, a sample, it's my sample in there. I own the publishing and have to write this for that song, and it was his first hit song. And every time you do something good, you inspire somebody else to do something. Every time you do something, if, especially if you do it good, you make it look easy. How many people want to play basketball because they watch Michael Jordan fly through the sky? You can't fly, but you're going to try. I tell you what, if you, do, if you can't fly, you'll buy his shoes and hope you learn how to fly. Okay? Same thing with me. I didn't play golf until Tiger Woods started playing. I had no interest in golf whatsoever until Tiger Woods started playing. Okay, I'm not a football player. I'm not, not football hurt. <laughs> so once you start doing something, and at the risk of sounding crazy, a little egotistical, I made it look easy back in the day. But what they didn't understand is before, when my last job was at a record company, so I sold records over the phone to all the record stores. So I had a list of all the record stores. But my, and my voice is very recognizable. People knew me for my voice before they knew my face. So I walked in to sell my record, sell my records, I started talking, oh, you got the guy from Record Shack, yeah. So I created an underground network between all the independent record stores and the swap meets. So as anybody wanted to be in the record business from Compton, they had to come to Lonzo. 
because I was a club promoter, I had a relationship with the radio station, K-Day. So when I went from buying advertising from my club to actually getting my, what, making records to get them played, I had those relationships, and they gave me an opportunity, and because I was spending money already. <coughs> so it is, when, you, when you have that kind of situation going on, it just makes it that much better, to, easier to work with. It's all about relationships. It's all about connections, it's about who you know and who knows you. Okay? In here right now, how many, do we have any artists in here? Put your hand, don't be ashamed to be an artist. If you're an artist, you cannot be bashful. The artist, we have anybody want to, in, want to be in law? So you're going to manage yourself and, and sue everybody too, right? <laughs> we got any lawyers? Any want, want to be lawyers in law? Business people? Okay. Graphic designers? That, this is your team right here. Your, your team starts right here. All y'all are hungry. All y'all looking to get started in something. You want hungry people around you. Not broke people, not starving people, but hungry people. <laughs> you don't want starving people. Okay, but you want hungry people, somebody that can motivate you, somebody that has the same motivation that you have. And once you start doing what you do, you'll be surprised who, who's willing to volunteer to help you. You got to be in motion first. You can't talk about what you want to do. Nobody can see your dreams but you. When you close your eyes at night and you have dreams, of driving this whatever or living wherever, nobody can see that but you. So in order for, you people, in order for people to see your dreams, you have to put your dreams into motion and let people see what you're capable of doing. And if they say, you know what, that's a good idea. Let's try this right. Perfect example. I got I to give somebody a shout out right quick. Judy Fox. I, do, I, I love doing PowerPoint presentations. But I'm basic. I'm basic. Grab a picture, put some words on it, grab a picture, next, next, next. Judy added all the color to this right here. She saw what I, what I, what I was capable of doing, but she took, took, took her skills and added it to it, made it, made it blow up. So you, once you show people what you're capable of doing, oh, man, that's good, but check this out. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So now you got a team. All right, next, anybody got more questions? Yes, Judy, okay. Yes. Um, but you were young and had parents once upon a time. So a lot of times, too, parents have their influence on what they want you to do. So can you kind of talk about your experience of when you were starting to emerge as an entrepreneur? Let me take a drink right quick. <laughs> well, yes, like everybody else, I had two parents. One of them died when I was 19. My mother died when I was 19. Whew. When I had a, um, when I was in high school, I had, I had, my girlfriend was pregnant. Now, talking about pressure. Ninth, I'm in, got into high school, new school, for, I went to <coughs> Centennial first in Compton, go to a new school in Cart Gardena, first week of school, guess what, I'm pregnant. Oh, Lord, have mercy. By the time I hit graduation time, uh, one semester before graduation, I get called to the counselor's office. Mr. Williams, uh, we realized you failed, you, uh, you had a fail, you failed typing in the 10th grade, so you're short five credits. God, now, I'm also the oldest in my family, so I'm the first one to graduate of the kids. Everybody's talking about me graduating. But I'm also got the other subject about the, about the got a girl pregnant. My daddy's like, what you going to do? What you going to do? My daddy's he was a no-nonsense no, no guy. What you going to do? Now, here's the problem for me. I, got through the, I, I, I made up the class, got the extra credits, so I'm graduating. My birthday is in June. My daughter, between graduating, between going to uh, walking, practice for walking, I have to leave and go take her, take her mom to the doctor. The day before I graduated, she was born. I turned 18 five days later. Talking about a brother stressed out. 
My dad worked for Caltrans on the freeways. Get you a good job working for Caltrans. Get you a good job working for Caltrans. <laughs> you take care of your baby. You can live in your mama's house. And I'm like, that's cool, but that ain't what I really want to do. But because my dad was my number one influence, I had to go and try to work for Caltrans. I did the job. I, did, took, I worked for Caltrans during the summertime, right here on the 605, in fact, on the 605. And in the morning, the traffic is rough on the 605. I had to put out sprinklers. And when the trucks pass you by, you put the sprinklers out as it goes around, to sucks the water on you, and you get drenched. Did that for a summer. I had some fun. I learned how to drive uh, pick, uh, um, back holes and uh, dumpers, stuff, stuff, dump trucks, whatever the case may be. That was fun. But that ain't what I wanted to do because I came home tired, dirty, all the time. Plus, I was trying to build my DJ business, and I couldn't, I couldn't be on the phone. There wasn't no cell phones back then. If I got a page, I couldn't answer the page till 7 o'clock that night. So eventually, I, um, I, went, I messed around and got a job at the record distributor. And I applied for the job at Caltrans at the same time. Well, a permanent job at Caltrans to appease my dad. Because you got a kid. You need a good government job, take care of your kid, and get you, know, get you some health the benefits, the whole nine yards. But I'm selling records for this record company. I get to be clean every day. I got air conditioning. I ain't got to be to work until 9 o'clock. I'm home at 5 o'clock. If I have a gig, they can call me at work. We can talk about it because I'm talking about it. They, they don't know what I'm talking about. They didn't check your phone like they do now. They, I, we just, I'm, on, I'm on the phone. They didn't care. Time came around at one point in time. Well, the Caltrans job came about. Time to go to work. God, dog. I did not want the Caltrans job. I did not want it. And, but I had to go because my dad had been talking about me going to Caltrans like I was going to his alma mater, his college or something. Like I was just, like I just got drafted to his favorite college to play ball for his boys. What you gonna do? You gonna be on maintenance? You gonna be on landscape? What you gonna do? I'm gonna be maintenance. So anyway, make a long story short, I drug my behind down to Caltrans right there at the 17, uh, 605 and 91. It's a yard right there, still there. And Friday morning, and on that this big, huge board with all these papers in it. This was not the digital age yet. Everything was still paper, and he had to grab a paper from each one of these slots, and I had to sign my name. They gave me my uniform, my helmet, had the white helmet, the orange shirt, the orange vest, the whole nine yards, and I'm dreading going out there. I said, God, give me one sign. Give me one sign, and I'm out of here. And the last piece of paper, he went to grab for it. It was empty. It was the insurance paper. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, little money maker. That's what they call me, little money maker. Uh, you got to start money. No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I left. I left. I said, thank you. That's all I needed. I left. I went back to my job at Couch, I mean, at, at Record Shack. I said, is my job still available? He says, yeah, if you want it. I said, cool. I took it. Now. Now, it's Friday, I got to tell my dad I didn't take the job at Caltrans. <laughs> Woo! I didn't tell it to Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, it, it, was, it was really crazy. His buddies were coming by the house all the time. They were drinking and celebrating. Yeah, you're going to be over there with so-and-so. That's my buddy. I trained him. You know, no, no, not really. <laughs> they, they don't know yet. All his buddies left. I'm sitting in the house, just me and my dad. And I said, hey, he says, what, you better go home, man, because you got to go to work tomorrow. I said, no, I don't. <laughs> you going to be late? No, I ain't. <laughs> <laughs> what you mean? I'm, I'm not taking that job. Ooh. Understand this, folks. I'm my dad's oldest son. He called me champ all his life. I was his number one son. That was all, these are all the names. I was going to follow in his footsteps. And I jumped out of his shoes. I got called some names that night. I can't say in front of y'all, OK? <laughs> it started with stupid, ignorant. I, I trained you all this right here. You're you going to do this right here. They're going to fire you in six months. And I tell him, man, I got to do what I want to do. I, I don't want the job. And you know, I left his house feeling about that big. 
I left there crying. He didn't, my old man never spanked me or nothing like that. Never. But he had a mental thing on me that was so cold that he didn't have to, he didn't have to spank me. I was a decent kid. I left there, went to work, went to work that morning at the other job. And uh, another thing happened that was really crazy. My buddy, who I got him the job, he was gone. He gave me his desk, his call sheet, his phone, everything. He calls me up. Man, you, you got me fired. How did I get you fired? So he, my buddy mad at me. My buddy mad, my daddy mad, and I really ain't no salesperson. I'm going to figure this out. Make a long story short, like my daddy said, six months later they fired me. I was out of a job. Okay? Now, understand why I was out of a job, though. Because I was building my DJ business. I'm DJing on the weekends. I'm getting 100, 150 a gig, sometimes 60 a gig, depending on what it was. But I was doing it Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, on a good weekend, I can make $450. My five days a week at the record company, I brought home $166. I don't need a calculator to figure out this is not, this is, I need to be doing something else. So what I would do, I would go to the warehouse, pull my records, go to the payroll department, give them to the lady in the payroll department, and she would give me a check for what was left over. Sometimes it would be $15, $16. And she, how can you live on $16? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So they thought I was stealing. <clears throat> then they realized I wasn't stealing. I had another job. So when things got slow, guess who was the first person they laid off? Me. They told me, oh, Mr. Williams, we understand you have another outside uh, business interest. Uh, I'm sorry, we got to let you go. Okay. Okay, I'm gone. They gave me my check. Back then, they, had, they, they gave you a... Uh, it held, a, it held a check in, in the hole, another check, vacation. I got about, about 500 bucks. Went to my dad's house. He still was mad at me, but he still had my back. And uh, told him what happened. He, oh, he glowed in. He glowed. I told you they was going to fire you. I told you they was going to fire you. <laughs> but what he did, though, he also knew I was doing my thing with uh, DJing. He loaned me some money to buy, my, well, buy, buy another turntable, and he took me to his friend, and that's how I got the Eve After Dark. He, he hooked me up with the guy, his buddy, who had just built a second floor to his nightclub below. He built, had a banquet hall on top of his uh, nightclub, and that was where the Eve After Dark was found at. And he told me, this, I'm going to tell you, like anybody, like he told me, I can get you in, but I can't keep you in. If, if you hook him up with something, it's not your job to keep him in. It's his job to stay there. If I introduce, introduce you to him, it's y'all have to make the relationship. It's not, it's not my job. I made the connection. Okay? So my dad made the connection. They hovered over me for about four or five months. Said I had a good idea what I was doing. They let me go. And I just left the club in March of this year after 40 years. 39 years and nine months. In fact, this, this, if I had stayed to, to the whole 40 years, it had been June 22nd, not 2019, it had been exactly 40 years that I opened the club up. Wow. So relationships, relationships, relationships. 